we are in the middle of the climate crisis, which requires all of us to be able to. One of the things that's happened is our it's not just that our individual attention has been destroyed, our collective attention is being destroyed. Our ability to achieve collective goals is being destroyed. And a species of people who spend their time alternating between TikTok and Twitter is not going to be able to solve the climate crisis. Those are things, particularly Twitter, that is designed to make people angry, that promotes anger and outrage. Ask me why later. Um, and and dealing with a big crisis requires sustained focus. It requires distinguishing truth from lies. It requires holding people accountable. And I had a real insight into this because obviously I went to Australia to do research for the book. And not long after they had, it was just before COVID, you remember it feels like a million years ago. It was only, well, two, well, two years ago, exactly two years ago, I think. They had what was called the Black Summer in which enormous parts of Australia burned down. There was a point, I think, where the entire coast of the state of New South Wales was on fire. Three billion animals burned to death or had to flee. Uh, Professor Kingsley Dixon called it a biological Armageddon, right? And there was a moment, it really landed for me. I'm ashamed to say that it was a very small thing about a city that made it real for me, but I was speaking to my friend, a friend of mine in Sydney at the height of the fires, and Sydney was quite a long way from the fires. Um, I mean, not that far, but the fires were in Sydney. And, and his, um, while we were talking, his smoke alarm went off. And he said, oh, I've got to take my batteries out of the smoke alarm. And I said, oh, is there something on fire? And he said, oh, no, this is happening all over Sydney. What was happening is from the wildfires, the smoke was coming in and the smoke was so dense that the fire alarms thought the building was on fire. And it was so disconcerting. And I remember talking to my friend Bruno Grisani, brilliant Swiss writer about this. And he said to me, oh, God, that's so frightening because it's like the, the local systems we built to alert us to immediate danger are working. But the bigger systems, the political systems that are designed to protect us, they're not working. Right. And I, I, I thought, of, as he said that, about something that, you know, that famous line W.H. Auden said at the height of the cold, well, the birth of the Cold War. Mm. Um, he said, we must love one another or die. And I thought, we need to focus together or we're going to face these fires alone. We need to get our focus back because we, in our own lives, it's damaging us. And collectively, we've got a lot to focus on. Okay, thanks very much. I think. Uh, you have some questions i think maybe not goodness me that thank you so much johan for that, for that oh, wonderful talk and, and that call to action um terrifying and, and inspiring i'd say which is <laughs> i want that to be my well that'd be my uh, epitaph here is <laughs> johan it was terrifying and inspiring <laughs> depending on who well, you were <laughs> johan before we go to the audience questions you've written in the past about addiction uh, i'm sure many in the audience have, have read your work on that um, there's a brilliant little section in Stolen Focus on ADHD and, and focus and addiction. Um, could you sort of speak to that a little and, and maybe anything surprising that you found in your research relating to, to ADHD and, and kids? Yeah, so there's something really big happening with children's attention. I can't remember if I mentioned this in the talk, but for every, I think I did, every child who was diagnosed with attention problems when I was seven, there's now 100 children diagnosed that way. Um, and there's obviously a big debate about this. And ADHD was probably the hardest chapter to write about because it's the one, sorry, I have to itch my nose. And if you've written a book about legalizing drugs, it looks very dodgy if you start rubbing your nose, but I apologize. Um, ADHD was difficult because it was the subject on which the scientists I interviewed most disagreed. So it's an extremely polarized, rambunctious debate. So on the one hand, you think about the debate in the United States, most American Americans who specialize on this, not all, um, believe this is primarily a biological problem, primarily a problem in children's genes, although they acknowledge that genes interact with the environment and are turned on and off by the environment. So they're, of course, e even the most hardcore people acknowledge there are significant environmental influences. There are other scientists who say, you know, the biological influences are real but minimal. This is mostly about the environment. Uh, and I'm a journalist. I, I'm a journalist with a training from Cambridge, undergraduate in social sciences. So this kind of science, but uh, a lot of this kind of science, but um, I don't think it, it's not for me to adjudicate on these specific scientific debates, but I do think there are things that are really worth knowing. I don't think it's a coincidence that, and this is very relevant to our situation in COVID now. I think the evidence is pretty clear. It's not a coincidence that this huge rise in children's attention problems coincided with a huge change in the nature of childhood. 
think about something as basic as everyone watching over the age of, um, you know, uh, 40, most of your childhood, you will have gone and played outdoors with other kids without any adult supervision, right? That was just, that's what childhood was. When my parents were kids in very different places, a Swiss village and a Scottish tenement, every single child did that, right? This, that was what human childhood was. Um, by 2003 in the US, only 10% of children ever played outdoors without adult supervision. So we effectively put all children under house arrest and this is before COVID, right? Um, and there's lots of components of that change that we know harm attention. I'll give you a really, really no shit Sherlock one, exercise, right? Professor Joel Nigg, the leading expert on children's attention problems explained this to me very clearly um, and has written about it in great detail. Um, children who run around, their brains are healthier, they make better brain connections and they can pay attention more. In fact, one of the best treatments for children who can't pay attention is to let them go and run around and then come back. But we have massively reduced the amount of time children run around. And then of course we had COVID. Now look, this was an airborne virus. I'm sympathetic, very sympathetic to the restrictions. I think they were necessary. I think we should have done them sooner, but we've got to acknowledge, and we must acknowledge this, this has come with a huge cost. But one of the really painful things is that actually the confining of our children has only been slightly worse under COVID than it was before, right? And this is a real opportunity for us to reconsider the nature of childhood. And one of the absolute heroes of my book, one of the, he uh, one of the best people I've, I know, is a woman called Lenore Skenazi, who runs a group. I really implore everyone who's a parent to go to letgrow.org. What she does, because you can't just say to individual parents, let your kids play outdoors, it's, it just doesn't work, right? They, even if they intellectually agree with you, um, if you're the only person who does it, if you know, you just look like a nutter and your child is frightened. But what Lenore does is persuades whole communities, whole streets, whole neighborhoods, whole schools to get kids to play outdoors again, to restore childhood, to play. And it's crucially playing outdoors without adults. And I went to places where they'd done this and it, it was incredibly emotional. It was like watching children come back to life. There was one 14 year old boy, I'll never forget this. It was, in, it was a part of Long Island, strapping big 14 year old boy, uh, we went to, they work in very poor neighborhoods and rich areas. And this was a really rich neighborhood, right? This was the, the French bakery is opposite the olive oil store to give you some sense of what it's like. And this guy, this young man told me, 14, he was 14, that until this program had begun, I think seven or eight months before, his parents had never let him play outside because the phrase he used was because of all these kidnappings. There have never been any kidnappings. I mean, in Long Island. He had a level of fear that would have been appropriate if he had been living in Medellin at the height of Pablo Escobar's terror, right? And then this program began and he started to play outdoors. And what's amazing is after a little while, him and his friends went into the woods and built a fort and they left their devices at home and they built a fort and they built things. And I remember after he left, Lenore was with me. Lenore said, God, think about human history. Think about prehistory, right? Prehistory is, uh, we're not meant to use that term anymore, but, um, but you know what I mean? Um, think about about human history for all of history children went out they hid they saw they built things and that boy and then and then we took it all away and then that boy given a chance went with his friends and he built a fort and he felt so much better and it was like watching these kids come to life so there's lots of things we need to do to restore childhood but I don't think we can figure out how much of these attention problems are due to genetics if we're depriving kids of so many of the things that they need and we're doing so many things that have been proven to harm their attention just think about what we feed them i mean there's so many things um so yeah that was a very long and ranty answer but i feel really passionate about that one no that's that's brilliant i'm also so glad that story didn't end with and then he was kidnapped so, so, <laughs> um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, there's so many brilliant questions lots of them about sleep um right. And uh, I, you, know, you, you talk a lot about in, in the book about sleep. In fact, I have a, an alarm clock now, uh, literally on my desk because of of your book. Uh, I, oh, I now um, keep my my phone charging in another room, and that's a tip for everyone. Um, how much of this is uh, just to, to, to lift off Carol's question? Um, hi, Carol. <laughs> hi, Carol. Um, the modern culture of sleep and, and all nighters and waking up at five a.m. to get on the grind. You know, some of this is is sort of sugar and, and coffee and uh, phones, but there has also been this sort of validation of bad sleep. Could, could you maybe speak to that? And, and to, and to the totally. So I interviewed loads of experts on this from um, Dr. Sandra Cooge in The Hague to uh, Professor Roxanne Prashad in Minneapolis. And 
this is one of the ones um it's possible there's a few contenders it's possible this is the single biggest contributor to our attention crisis it's hard to quantify them but i think the the look at when you look at the evidence so one of the people who really unlocked this for me is a man named Dr. Charles Seisler, who's at Harvard Medical School, who's arguably the, certainly one of the two or three leading experts on sleep in the world. And he started to study this in 1981. He came to this subject. Um, sorry, my desk nearly fell down then. Uh, he came to this subject quite by accident. He was studying a kind of technical question about the time that a, hormone, a particular hormone is released in the body. And in order to study that, you had to keep people awake in a lab, right? So we had to just do tests to keep them awake, like, you know, show them a, a car, picture of a car, and then take it away and say, what color was the car I just showed you? That kind of thing. And he was really struck by something, which is um, people's attention deteriorates incredibly badly when they're kept awake. You know, if you're kept awake for just 19 hours, I think this is the figure, your attention is as bad as if you'd got drunk. 19 hours does not seem like much to me, right? Um, the, the, um, so he, when, when Dr. Seisler had been at med school, he had been taught that um, when you're asleep, you're, you, nothing is happening, very little is happening. Your, your brain is effectively inert. It's a passive process, right? A bit like my arm muscles, I'm not using them now. I hardly ever use them as you can probably tell. Um, the, uh, they're inert, right? so that was thought oh when you're asleep you know your brain's just inert is waiting for you to wake up maybe it's doing a little bit of dream function that kind of thing but but actually it was discovered your brain that sleep is a profoundly active process that a whole series of things happen in sleep that are absolutely essential for mental function and in particular for attention and focus but he did this study at one point he pioneered a technique that brought together two technologies so one technology can scan your eyes and see what you're looking at and the other technology scans your brain and obviously sees what's happening there. And he discovered this really frightening phenomenon called local sleep, which is where you appear to be awake, you're looking around you, uh, you can talk, but whole parts of your brain have gone to sleep. It's called local sleep because it's local to one part of the brain. Um, and, and the way Professor Roxanne Prashad at the University of Minneapolis, where I interviewed her, put it to me is, when you're sleeping, you're repairing your brain is cleaning itself. Your, your cerebral spinal fluid channels, they open up, they're, they're rinsed with a kind of um, watery fluid that washes away what Roxanne calls the, the, uh, the brain cell poop that builds up during the day, the metabolic waste, and takes it down to your liver and flushes it out of your body. If you don't sleep properly, that doesn't work as well. Now, we sleep on average an hour less than we did in 1942. Children sleep 85 minutes less than they did a century ago. And Dr. Seisler said to me, even if nothing else had changed, even that was the only thing that had happened, that alone would be causing a really big attention crisis. And obviously that's not the only thing that's changed. So absolutely, I think sleep is a, a, a huge factor. Um, and there's all sorts of things we need to do to restore sleep, both individually and collectively to make it possible. Think about the four day week. The biggest change people told me in the offices, I sleep more, right? It, it, there's no point giving people self-help lectures about sleeping more and all these other things if they can't do them, right? Because they're so amped up, they're so stressed. There are Most people have some margin of change they can make in their life, but we've also got to fight for the collective changes that make those individual changes possible. And there's lots more that are relevant to sleep I can talk about, but I'm conscious this is a long answer that i'm giving so yeah no no it's, it's it's brilliant and also brain cell poop is the name of my punk band um, <laughs> so, so from from bill bill says uh, love this book hey, and past work um oh. your book on depression and anxiety has touched lots of people myself included um it's well known that being depressed uh, anxious reduces your attention span but in stolen focus you didn't really directly link attention and anxiety depression did you deliberately resist doing that were you tempted to merge the two topics do you see them as separate oh that's a good question um What's the honest answer? I think the honest answer is I, there was so much that I wanted to explain about attention and focus. And I didn't want the book to be that long because I want the people who can't pay attention to focus to read it. That if I could have written the infinitely long book I want, always want to write, uh, I would definitely have included a lot of stuff about that. And I do think there's one really obvious way. It comes back to what we were saying before about achieving your goals. There's lots of ways in which these subjects are interconnected. Um, loneliness causes hypervigilance. I remember Professor John Cassiopo, leading expert in the world on loneliness, who I interviewed for Lost Connections, talked a lot about that. That just being lonely makes you more hypervigilant and makes it harder for you to sleep, actually. There's a really interesting... Um, people who are lonely 
experience more when they sleep of what are called micro awakenings. Um, it's actually turns out to be a very good biological way of measuring loneliness is measuring someone's micro awakenings. So micro awakenings, you won't remember them when you wake up, but you just wake up more. It seems to be Professor Cassiopo's theory was it was because we evolved to live in tribes, right, on the savannas of Africa, just like bees evolved to live in a tribe human sorry bees evolved to live in a hive humans evolved to live in a tribe and if you were separated from the tribe in the circumstances where we evolved you would wake up more because you had no one's looking out for you right you're in danger um i mean that's obviously it's hard to know how we would disprove that but that was his working hypothesis um but i also think a lack of attention as attention breaks down it makes you more anxious right because you're just you're less good at achieving your goals you're less good at solving your problems. Um, and if you're surrounded by people who also are less good at achieving their goals and less good at solving their problems, there's just more problems around, right? So I think there's a very complicated interconnection. And uh, yeah, I was very tempted to write about that, but I thought, oof, better not. Yeah, fair enough. You can't write about everything. And there is enough in the book, I, I promise. <laughs> um, so Martin asks, um, linking to your last book, can teenagers build connections without social media? when all their peers are should managing its use be formally taught in school to support them um, they definitely can uh, and at some level they crave to but to be honest i think i mean i'm of course i'm a favorite teaching things in school but the truth is we've got to take on the big powerful force right and the truth is very simple every time your child your teenager picks up facebook picks up tiktok picks up snapchat those companies make more money. And every time your child puts those things down, those companies make less money. It's really simple. So every algorithm they have, every feat of engineering genius they have is designed to get your child to pick up those devices as often as possible and, and scroll as long as possible. That's it. And as long as that business model persists, they will carry on invading your children. So, um, Asa Raskin, who designed a key part of the internet, I can explain it to you if you want, but just for purpose, just take my, my word for it for a minute, designed a key part of the internet. Um, he said to me that we need to, um, the, the solution, the first step in the solution is very simple. We need to ban that business model, right? Just ban it. Just say a model that is based on surveilling us in order to find the weaknesses in our attention, hack them and sell our attention to advertisers. Because that's of course why they're doing it, why they want us to scroll just ban it and then they'll be forced to move to another business model now there are lots of other business models one would be subscription like netflix we pay a small amount each month one would be something that everyone has nearby them right now before we had sewers we had shit in the streets we had cholera so we all pay to build the sewers and we all own the sewers together we own the sewage pipes and it might be that like we own the sewage pipes together we might want to own the information pipes together because we're getting the equivalent of cholera for our attention. The crucial thing is when you move that business model, when you change that business model, suddenly you and your kid's attention are no longer the product these companies sell to advertisers. Suddenly you're the customer. Let's figure out what do you want? Oh, you want to be able to pay attention. Oh, you want to be able to meet up with your friends offline. Okay, we need to redesign the product to do that. At the moment, these products are designed as wonderful people like my friend Tristan Harris have been warning, these products are currently designed to hack and invade our attention, but they can just as easily be designed. It's perfectly technologically feasible. It's politically feasible. They can just as easily be designed to heal our attention. But to do that, we've got to get the business incentives right. Everything else is going to be tinkering at the edges when it comes to the technology, because you can teach kids at school, but a teacher in a classroom versus all the engineers in Silicon Valley is not an is, you know it's an asymmetric fight right yeah oh, there's the so not to say that what you're saying isn't a good proposal it is but it's just we, we, we that i'm all in favor of what you're proposing but we've also got to go to the heart of the death star right mm -hmm. uh, that sounds fun um it, there's there's a lot of <laughs> about twitter and about, about emails and stuff like that uh, there's actually one of my favorite moments in your book is is when you come back from provincetown and you've spent three months off emails and twitter and you open up and you realize that you're not that important. Um, and, and you say, <laughs> and you say, so and you say that your, your ego has been poked. Um, like how much do you think of social media and that constant uh, you know, flitting attention um, sort of is about that feeling of self-importance that it gives you, it sort of hijacks your brain? It's a really good question. Yeah, I remember coming back and thinking, oh, I'm gonna have so many emails and <laughs> weeks to get through them. And because I had an auto reply that just said, I'm gone. Actually I had hardly, it took me literally like an hour, I think to go through emails. I was like, oh. You know, you know, I was like, well, the world didn't need me after all, right? 